We think of 1940s America as a simpler time, but even then there were grisly murders, disappearances, and mob hits, some of which have become legendary in the annals of crime, and a number of them remain unsolved to this day. Murder Incorporated gangster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel made his fortune from bootlegging, prostitution, and murder for hire. In a more bizarre scheme, he tried to sell an explosive known as Atomites to Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's military. But for all his notoriety, no one knows for sure who gunned him down in Beverly Hills, California in 1947. Siegel was in California on business and to visit his daughters who lived with his former wife, Esta. After dinner with a handful of friends and business partners, Siegel returned to the house of his mistress, Virginia Hill, who'd left for Paris after a lover's quarrel. There, a gunman shot him twice in the face and twice in the chest. Police struggled to narrow down the suspect list. Siegel had a long list of enemies. He had construction debts related to his Vegas casino, and East Coast mobsters like Salvatore Lucky Luciano hated him, as did Virginia Hill's family for mistreating her. The cost overruns for the Flamingo were due mostly to excessive skimming by Bugsy Siegel. But the lead suspect was Murder Incorporated honcho Mike Lansky. In 1947, an FBI informant claimed Lansky had identified the killer as Virginia's brother Chick. But in 2014, Robbie Sedway, son of Siegel's bookkeeper Mo Sedway and his wife B, told LA Magazine his mother's lover Matthew Panza killed Siegel before Siegel could kill Mo. Mo had reportedly ratted to Lansky about Siegel's financial issues. So it seems Lansky was happy to see Siegel go, one way or another. In 1947, fashion designer Vera West, who worked on now classic Universal films such as The Bride of Frankenstein and The Killers, was found dead in her pool by photographer Robert Landry. Police found two notes addressed to Jack Chandler. The first one read, This is the only way. I am tired of being blackmailed. And the second one said, The fortune teller told me there was only one way to duck the blackmail I paid for 23 years. Death. A medical examiner determined that she probably drowned, but the Los Angeles County coroner refused to sign the death report. The blackmail was likely a reference to whatever scandal triggered West's move from New York to California in 1924. The likeliest suspect was her husband, Jack C. West, who gave conflicting accounts about his whereabouts on the night of her death. He also claimed there was no blackmail, but said her behavior had been erratic. Vera's friends, however, suspected her death was a murder made to look like a suicide. The investigation was full of holes and left unanswered questions. Police never established whether Jack Chandler and Jack West were the same person, nor did they ever identify the blackmailer or the fortune teller. Suicide didn't explain how the hydrophobic Vera ended up in the pool. She was afraid to even go near it alone. And then the big question, why did Jack West demolish their house and disappear without a trace? The case is considered cold, but the mystery remains intriguing. The body of Elizabeth Short, dubbed the Black Dahlia, was found in Los Angeles in 1947 by a mother walking with her child on the street. Short had been brutally murdered. She had suffered blunt force head trauma, had both sides of her mouth slit, and had been severed in half at the waist. The only evidence was the body. The killer had scrubbed it clean. The troubled Shorts had left Massachusetts for California as a minor, where she was arrested for underage drinking in 1943. By 1947, she was a regular at Hollywood nightclubs and other fancy joints. According to local resident Vera French, who took Short in at one point, she amassed a laundry list of suitors and boyfriends. French said one of Elizabeth's exes had threatened to kill her for moving on to other men. Los Angeles Police Department officer Myrtle McBride gave an account that agreed with French's, adding that a girl resembling Short had approached her on the street for help with a violent ex, although McBride was not able to identify her with certainty. The case is still cold, complicated by bizarre false confessions. However, observers noted that whoever cut up her body very likely had medical training. In 2016, retired Los Angeles police detective Steve Hodell told The Guardian that his father, Dr. George Hodell, had done it, although it's impossible to say for sure since much of the original evidence is gone. In 1943, Italian socialist and journalist Carlo Tresca, a fierce critic of Mussolini, was gunned down in New York City. At the time of his death, people suspected everyone from Mussolini and Italian fascists, who had a warrant out for him, to American communists. He had that many enemies. But in mid-20th century New York, where there was murder, there was often the Cosa Nostra. In fact, future Bonanno family boss Carmine Galante was believed to be the shooter. He was head of the Bonanno crime family. Known as the Cigar, he was widely feared for his cruelty. Galante spent some time in jail as a suspect in the murder, but he was released without charges and the case was never closed. Tresca was likely the victim of an alliance between fascist Italy and Cosa Nostra kingpin Don Vito Genovese. 
Tresca had stymied Mussolini's activities in America for years. Despite Mussolini's anti-mafia campaign during the 1920s, the dictator grew close to Genovese, who functioned sort of like his American fixer. So when Tresca hindered Mussolini's influence among Italians in America, he also ran afoul of Genovese. In fact, Tresca allegedly threatened to expose a drug ring Genovese ran out of Italy. Though it seemed Genovese had Tresca killed, both out of self-interest and as a favor to Mussolini. Lucky Luciano quipped in 1961 that when Mussolini had a problem, Genovese would take care of it for him. One of those problems, Luciano said, was Tresca. The Texarkana Moonlight murders were two double and one single murder that took place near Texarkana, Texas between March and May of 1946. Teenagers Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore were removed from their car, shot in the head with a 32 caliber pistol, and returned to the vehicle. The following month, the second pair of teens were dragged out of their car and shot, again with a 32. A third murder hit the news in May when Virgil Starks was shot in his home. His wife survived with two bullets to the face. In Starks' case, the killer used a 22 but left similar tire tracks at the scene. Police believe the crimes were related. A third couple, Jim Hollis and Mary Jean Larry, who survived a similar attack in February, reported an assailant wearing a burlap sack and armed with a gun, likely a pistol, which he used to whip Hollis. Like at least one of the murdered women, Larry had been sexually assaulted, another detail the attacks had in common. The killings caused panic in Texarkana. When dark came, the kids came in. People didn't go downtown too much. They were frightened. Gun sales skyrocketed, and women took their children to hotels whenever their husbands were out of town. Police never confirmed the killer's identity, but Texarkana native and author James Presley, nephew of the Bowie County Sheriff who investigated the murders, told Texas Monthly that the killer was likely a man named Ewell Sweeney, who was incarcerated on car theft charges in 1947. The case, however, is officially cold. Sisters Anne and Margaret Richards were granddaughters of Tennessee hotel mogul Joseph Richards. The sisters, who were white, along with Leonard Brown, a black teenager who worked for them, were murdered in their Oliver Springs mansion in 1940 in a cold-blooded killing that brought together crime and race in the Jim Crow South. It's been over 75 years, you know, and people are still reluctant to talk about it. Initially, law enforcement suspected Brown of killing the sisters in a murder-suicide. The killer had positioned the gun to make it seem like Brown had killed himself after shooting the women. Witnesses added that Brown had left the house of the family that owned the murder weapon the same morning, suggesting he'd stolen the gun. With this evidence, the sheriff closed the case and declared Brown guilty, but there were doubts. Brown was known as a good kid who was afraid of loud banks, and he'd been shot in the forehead from above, an unlikely trajectory for a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In 2000, a man reported seeing two other men leave the mansion on the day of the killing. After the men threatened him, the witness skipped town. Based on his testimony, law enforcement exonerated Brown and tied the killing to a property dispute the woman had with their cousin, Mary Signet, who had lost a property case against a pair years earlier. But all the suspects are dead, including one suspect who was shot to death by another, reportedly to prevent him from talking to the police. Boyle heiress Georgette Bauerdorf was found dead in her bathtub in 1944, wearing only her pajama top. The Los Angeles Police Department initially suspected an accident because her valuables were untouched, apart from a missing $100. But when they found a medical bandage stuffed down her throat, they realized she'd been murdered. Beyond the bandage, her body was bruised, her skull punched in, and her knuckle bones shattered. She'd put up a fight. Police searched Bauerdorf's diary for clues. The journal contained the names of soldiers she'd been involved with, and they became suspects. Police suspected Corporal Cosmo Volpe, who was witnessed aggressively pursuing Bauerdorf and getting between her and other men on the dance floor at the Hollywood Canteen, where she worked. But police released him after his alibi checked out. Sergeant Gordon Adland, who hitched a ride with her and became the last person to see her alive, was also exonerated after questioning. According to retired Los Angeles Police Detective Steve Hodell, the biggest clue may be the medical bandage found lodged in her throat, a kind that hadn't been available in the area for over 20 years. With that in mind, Hodell has suggested that the killer was a medical professional, similar to whoever murdered and dismembered Elizabeth Short. Lewis Allen, a pure food activist and college chemistry professor, was murdered at his house in Westfield, Massachusetts in 1940. He lived in a respectable home with his wife, ran a lab, and taught classes at what is today Westfield State University. One night in May, after an argument with an unidentified person at his door, Allen was shot twice in the face and twice in the body. His killer was never caught. Sensational theories surfaced to explain Allen's killing, accusing everyone from Nazis who wanted his patents for food preservations to a food industry angry at his promotion of pure food standards, and even the mafia, which had supposedly targeted Allen for being a government informant, according to Westfield historian Bob Brown. However, according to Brown, none of these had any basis in fact. 
They were just grand conspiracy theories that sprang up amid intense national coverage after law enforcement failed to solve the crime. Brown hints at two alternative possibilities. Allen had a reputation as a womanizer and may have had relationships with his female students. Given that the murder began with an argument, it's possible Allen ran afoul of a father, husband, or boyfriend of one of these women and was killed in a crime of passion. Or maybe he was killed by someone who lost money by investing in a company Allen had promoted. Either way, the killing remains unsolved 84 years later. Margaret Trees was a war widow and divorcee who moved to Iowa after divorcing her second husband in West Virginia. One morning in 1947, two workers found her dead in a Davenport, Iowa park. According to the Esterville Daily News, she was found naked, badly disfigured, and covered with tattoos, which led her killing to be dubbed the Tattoo Murder Case. Her killers had shown no mercy, stabbing her at least 10 times and even running her over with a car. Police quickly turned their attention to Trees' social circles, which included a handful of men with whom she appeared to have been romantically involved. Trees was also known as a regular at the taverns on Davenport Skid Row. Witnesses said she was last seen outside a Skid Row bar getting into a car with three men. In 1956, however, the Cedar Rapids Gazette reported that an unidentified woman who described herself as an acquaintance of Trees had seen her just a few hours before her death in a car with two men. According to the news reports, both men were known police figures. Police never ascertained a motive and no one was ever charged. At this point, the perpetrators are likely dead. In the 1930s, the Brooklyn waterfront was a haven of mob activity. According to Tom Folsom's The Mad Ones, Crazy Joe Gallo, and the revolution at the edge of the underworld, mobsters like Gallo got their start there, enforcing kickback schemes, roping workers into rigged numbers games, and directing them to mafia loan sharks to cover their losses. Tired of their tactics, Italian longshoreman Pete Panto attempted to rally people against the Cosa Nostra in July 1939. He disappeared a week later. Panto's fate was confirmed in 1941 when his body was found buried in a New Jersey lime pit. According to a Time Magazine story from 1952, Panto had run afoul of none other than Umberto Anastasio, better known as High Lord Executioner Albert Anastasio, who ruthlessly ran the New York waterfront. Within the Mafia, Anastasio was recognized as a uh, ruthless, unflinching killer. According to the outlet, New York Mayor Bill O'Dwyer, at the time a Brooklyn prosecutor, had promised to bring the killers to justice. Unfortunately, Murder Incorporated hitman Abe Reles, the city's star witness, conveniently took a fatal fall out of a window before trial. This was, of course, Mayor O'Dwyer's account. Time, however, revealed that O'Dwyer had buried a conversation between two of Anastasia's men discussing Panto's killing and directly implicating the capo. Furthermore, Anastasia was never questioned, the first thing any good detective would have done. So although Panto's murder is technically unsolved, everyone knew who was behind it. 21-year-old Texarkana native Virginia Carpenter was supposed to start school at the Texas State College for Women in Denton. Instead, she disappeared after a taxi dropped her off in front of her dorm on the night of June 1, 1948. After Carpenter vanished, police immediately went to see the last person to see her, taxi driver Edgar Zachary. He told police Carpenter met two men in a car in front of her dorm when he dropped her off at 9.30 p.m. She knew them and said they were going to help her with her luggage, so he went home. However, years later, Zachary's wife testified that he didn't come home until 2 or 3 a.m. If true, why did he lie? But the driver passed his polygraphs and was released without charges. If Zachary was being truthful, then the men were probably the kidnappers. Their identities are unknown since all suspects named over the years are dead. But there's one more chilling detail that might provide a clue. Virginia Carpenter knew three of the Texarkana Moonlight murder victims, a statistically near impossible coincidence considering Texarkana had a population of nearly 25,000 in 1950. One theory is that the Texarkana killer tracked her down and killed her too. But since those crimes also remain unsolved, it's impossible to know. Carpenter was presumed murdered and declared legally dead in 1955, though her body was never found. Walter Krakauer, better known as Whitey Krakow, was one of Bugsy Siegel's hitmen and was involved in the 1939 slaying of underworld figure Harry Big Greeny Greenberg. According to Murder Incorporated by Burton Turkis, a law enforcement officer involved in prosecuting members of the outfit, Krakow and several other hitmen ambushed Greenberg as he returned to his California home after an evening drive. But Krakow didn't live much longer. Burton writes that the authorities scrambled to get any witnesses and informants into witness protection before Siegel could clip them too. Krakow was one of those people of interest, with Burton suggesting the FBI was willing to offer him a deal if he talked. Unfortunately for investigators, Krakow was gunned down on New York City's Lower East Side in August 1940. Siegel was arrested as a suspect in all of the killings, especially the Greenberg hit, along with an associate named Frank Carbo, who was also charged with murder. 
However, Siegel got lucky. Government star witness A. Reles, a partner of Krakow, fell at a window to his death in 1941, so Siegel's case was dismissed due to lack of evidence. Carbo's case ended in a hung jury despite multiple witnesses identifying him with certainty as the killer, so he walked too. Thus, although Krakow's murder was probably on Siegel's orders to prevent him from turning informant, officially his case remains unsolved. Detectives Ferdinand Socha and Joseph Lynch were members of the New York City Police Department's bomb squad. They were called to disable a suitcase bomb at the 1939-1940 World's Fair, which blew up and killed them. New York City saw a spike in political violence in the 1930s, including bomb attacks thanks to conflicts between local communists and the German-American Bund, a pro-Nazi German-American organization. Because the bomb had been found in the British Pavilion, police immediately suspected the Bund, which had also been accused of trying to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge. But investigators came up empty despite a $26,000 reward. Without any clear connection to the Bund, the only suspects left were the British themselves. NYPD officer and historian Bernard Whelan told Atlas Obscura that Hitler was desperate to keep the United States out of Europe in hopes of avoiding a larger war he could not win. Thus, it wasn't in the Bund's interest, if they represented the Nazi Party's strategy, to carry out attacks against American targets. American public opinion was either mostly pro-German or anti-interventionalist, and terrorism risked gutting that. The British, however, wanted American involvement in Europe as soon as possible. According to one theory, British intelligence might have false flagged the U.S. with a terror attack on American soil that could be blamed on Hitler's supporters in America. As compelling as the theory is, it of course remains mere conjecture to this day.